Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Transition Booster, Transition 101, The Basics. We'll give the others some time to be admitted here and we'll get started with some announcements. Please keep muted and turn your video functions off during the presentation. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Transition 101. We're still letting people in, so hang tight and we'll get started very shortly. Madam, is it on? Hmm? Mike is on. No, it's on. When it gets cold, it will get hard. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Transition 101. Please mute your microphones and turn your videos off. We're still admitting folks. We're just going to take another moment and get started. Okay, well, it's 7.03 and we are ready to get started tonight. Good evening and welcome to our Cleveland area transition booster. Our topic tonight is Transition 101, The Basics. Thanks for joining us tonight. This webinar will provide you and others and families and caregivers who have youth or young adults with disabilities, some very important transition information. My name is Amy Clausen and I'm the Northern Ohio Family Support Specialist at the Ohio Family to Family Health Information Center. We are housed at the University of Cincinnati Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities, and we sit within Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. Please feel free to reach out to me anytime should you need assistance. You should be able to see my contact information on the screen. And if everyone could please mute your microphones and turn off your videos, we'll continue the presentation. We're still letting folks in as I speak. My goal is to help you help your loved one have a good life. And we're so glad you can all join us tonight. I can't do this alone. I wanna thank you for joining us. And while we're waiting for everyone to get acclimated, I really would love to highlight my partners in crime, the team, the planning team extraordinaire. We're so lucky to have them. LiveSpecial.com, Wendy Spitz is here with us tonight. The Upside of Downs, Summit County, Medina County, Portage County, and Cuyahoga County Boards of Developmental Disabilities all help us put on these wonderful transition booster sessions. Milestones, Autism Resources, Autism Society of Greater Cleveland, and the Friendship Circle. We all work hard to bring these transition boosters to you tonight and the rest of the year and beyond. 
We're still admitting folks. So a few more things before I introduce our speaker. We wanna make sure that you understand that we are recording the session tonight. All of the video functions are gonna be turned off except for the speakers and your microphones are asked to be muted and stay muted. We're going to be using the chat box to enter your questions throughout the presentation and Wendy will be monitoring the chat room. And the recording and all the presentation materials from tonight's presentation will be available on our Ohio Family to Family website. Don't forget, we always value your feedback. There will be an evaluation survey that Wendy will post in the chat box later on tonight. So we do have our website and training calendar updated for the next transition boosters. September 30th on backwards planning, we'll have Chris Fuller from Ocali. That's sure to be a wonderful presentation. Uh, October 21st, Employment and Beyond with DODD, the Ohio Department of Developmental Disabilities, will be presenting. Please check out our training calendar. And we hope you can attend. So again, tonight we'll be learning about Transition 101. It's going to be a foundation to help us get started. Or if you've already kind of started transition for your youth or a loved one, this will be sort of a refresher for you. After our presenter, we'll then have some time to briefly learn about some life course tools that have been used by other parents during the discussions of transition to adulthood for their loved one. I'm looking forward to that at the end here tonight. We think that those tools will be very useful to you, so we hope you find them useful. So we are ready to introduce our fantastic speaker tonight. Bob Ross Hello. is here with us tonight. If you can please mute your microphones, we'd appreciate that. Bob Ross is a leader in Northeast Ohio, which is why he was asked to share his expertise with, expertise with us. Bob has spent over 35 years in enhancing the lives of people with disabilities and special health care needs. While he's had so many roles over the years, he is currently the state support team region three consultant where he specializes in secondary transition and special education. Prior to this new role, he was in the Mayfield City School District special education coordinator. And previous to that, he spent six years developing and leading the Cuyahoga East Vocational Education Consortium, known as CVEC. And it is now a very successful school program for youth with disabilities today. During his spare time, Bob also teaches classes at the Cleveland State University. And as you can imagine, his accomplishments are vast and we don't have time to name them all other than to say, thank you, Bob. We're so grateful for your passion and for your amazing work. And with that said, I will hand it over to Bob right now. Okay. Thank you, Amy. Let me, uh, if you'll allow me a second here to get set up. And hopefully everyone is able to uh, see my slides here. I just need to do one more thing here. Okay, so yeah, thanks, Amy. I, I appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight. And I wanna thank you and your, your many, many partner agencies to come and talk about um, a topic that's uh, near and dear to my heart, which is transition. Um, 
as you had mentioned, um, there will be uh, the, this PowerPoint will be posted on your website and I can also share it at the end of my presentation. Um, there's a lot of information here. There's um, several hyperlinks that I know Wendy is going to put into the chat as well. And also when you receive the, uh, the PowerPoint, you'll be able to um, go back and kind of take a look at some of the information that I have provided. So the material that I'm gonna to cover tonight is really all about transition from a 30,000 foot view. Um, Amy had mentioned that I teach at Cleveland State and one of the classes I teach is a life skills and career planning class. And that's a semester long class. It's about 45 hours altogether. Um, so um, tonight what we're gonna do is we're gonna have about a half an hour, 35 minutes of just the kind of the basic transition 101 stuff. But I know you have some great speakers coming up down the line that are going to, um, I'm sure, build upon some of the information that I'll share with you tonight. Um, so I don't know if any of you have ever participated in a cascade activity, but what you're going to need for this, and um, I, I'm, I'm not, unable to see the chat, so I'm relying on Wendy um, and uh, others to help me with this is, um, the way a, casc a cascade activity works is what you're going to do is you're going to open your chat. Uh, it's that little box down, looks like the cartoon, uh, where the cartoon speaker talks, it's down at the bottom there. And what I'm going to ask you to do is, don't do it until I count to three, what do you believe is the purpose of secondary transition planning? In other words, the why. So I want you to take just a couple seconds to think about that. And I'd like you to open your chat and I'd like you to type into the chat box what you think the purpose of secondary transition planning is, the why, but don't hit the send yet. Don't hit that little arrow, okay? So I'm gonna pause here for 15, 20 seconds for you to type something in. And then I'm gonna do the countdown to three and see what you come up with. Okay, I am going to count to three. And at that point, I would like you to hit the send on your chat. You ready? One, two, three. And Wendy, since I can't see the chat, I'm gonna rely on you just to read out a few things that you're seeing come in. Hopefully there's some, there's a lot of stuff coming in. Yeah, stuff just came through. To okay. make sure that each person needs are met at each stage of life, that is, that is one thought. Another thought, successful adult life to reach um, student goals and advocacy, um, to prepare my son for the future, to help promote a positive adulthood, mapping um, for the way forward, prep your students for integration into the community, gather resources, for students, families to have a plan and a purpose, to prepare for adulthood, to prepare a loved one to be, have some levels of in, in, in independence, prepare for life and adulthood. So students will have success after leaving high school. Equip children to make the best decisions for their future beyond high school. Do you want me to keep going? No, no, that's good. Maybe give me one or two more, okay? Okay, prepare students for life after school and prepare them for adulthood. Excellent. Okay. Perfect. Okay. okay. That, fantastic. Um, so that, the, every one of those chat comments is right on the money, okay? So how are we doing? So what, what you see here is some data on how students with disabilities are faring. Um, this is from the Ohio Department of Education, Office of Exceptional Children. Um, and uh, uh, this is information that might, it might be a little dated, it might be a, a, a couple of years old, um, but just some, some quickie facts here that in, in Ohio, each year there are 90,000 plus students with disabilities who are the age of transition, which in Ohio is 14. The graduation rate for students with disabilities with a regular high school diploma is 21%, meaning 21% of students with disabilities 
um, earn a diploma by the standard pathway compared to 85% of all students. Four-year graduation rate um, on time in 2017 uh, for all students is 84%, and for students with disabilities, it's 70%. And I think that's kind of a, a so maybe a skewed kind of statistic because we know not every student's going to graduate in four years. They might have special needs that would necess necessitate them to stay in school a little bit longer. Um, this one really gets me. 20% of students with disabilities drop out of school each year. I, I just, that, that really, I, I find that, that criminal. <laughs> um, and then um, more than 18,500 secondary students with disabilities took part in career tech education in 2018. And there were approximately 1,000 fewer students um, than Ohio's average for students with disabilities participating. Now, there is a hyperlink at the bottom there that takes you to the Ohio Longitudinal Transition Study. Um, I'm not going to go too in depth, but per IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, every school system has to, on a fi every five years, complete an exit survey. And basically what that is, is that they are asking their students with disabilities when they are exiting, either aging out or graduating from high school, um, what their plans are for after high school, what their anticipated plans are in employment, in education, um, in independent living. They also ask those students to rate the services that they received. So um, if when you get the time, you can go and take a look and see. Um, as I said, every district has to do this per IDEA every five years. And really the data there is something that could be useful, not only for a school system, but for a region and the state as well to really say, okay, what are we doing well? What are we not doing well? Um, a couple uh, just sort of things that I, I think are important. Now, this is from the OLTS data from students that exited and how it worked is they would ask students when they exited high school, where do you want to be? And then a year later, they would come back and survey those same students and ask them, okay, so you said this is where you want to be. Where are you now? So 35% of the graduates during that 2010-17 period, 35 of them anticipated that they wanted to go to a two-year uh, two school. Actual number was 20%. 28% of those graduates wanted to go to a four-year college. That's where they reported. Actual number a year later was 14% of those students. 60% said they anticipated some type of college, whether it's just taking a class. Um, and the actual numbers for that was 37%. 38% of graduates anticipated part-time work. A year later, it was 24%, and then 40% anticipated full-time work. The actual number was um, 31%. Um, overall, our numbers are really improving as far as employment, and a lot of that has to do with good transition planning, as well as our partnership with our adult service agencies, such as County Board of DD and Opportunities for Ohioans with Disabilities. So what is secondary transition? It's basically, getting students ready for life after high school, but operationalizing it as part of their IEP or their individual education plan. So I, I love that Wendy, or that, that Amy said um, the good life, because that's something that I keep coming back to a, lo a lot as well. So when I think about transition, I don't see it as an exercise in compliance, but I see it as how can we prepare students for a good life? And, and, and so what, what does a good life mean? So we are going to, once again, do a cascade activity. You guys are all pros at how this, how this works. And this time, and wait till I count to three, in your chat, when you think about the good life for yourself or for your child, what does that mean? What is a good life? So I'm gonna be quiet for about 15, 20 seconds, and then I'm gonna to count to three and have you put your comments in the chat or send your comments.
Okay. So I am going to count to three and you are going to then send your chat. You're ready? One, two, three. And Wendy, once again, I'm going to count on you. Maybe just yeah. give, give us some, um, yeah. I know I probably don't have time for all of them, but some okay. of them that jump out to you, okay? A life with purpose, that is fulfillment, how each individual can best do that. That is one. That is happy, being pleased with where you are and doing independence, a life that is meaningful, fulfilling and meaningful to the person in question, be healthy, be able to sustain oneself, live independently as possible. Um, I want my child to be safe and accepted into the community, just to be happy and basic needs taken care of, connecting people, feelings to parts of their community, peace and purpose, being happy in life, becoming independent. There's a lot of them. Let me know when you want me to stop. No, that's good. Excellent. Okay. Fantastic. Okay. So um, I know Wendy didn't get a chance to go through all of them. So we probably saw th some things in the chat that related to employment. And when we think about the good life and employment, it's not, not just about having a job. It's about having a job that gives you fulfillment and happiness. Um, that meets your economic needs and provides a certain level of self-sufficiency. Some of it relates to the good life, including continuing education after high school, education and training. Um, it doesn't include just college, but engaging in education and training that can develop your skills and may provide you with a path to advancement in work, but also in being more independent. Um, and actually speaking of college, um, there are more and more students with intellectual disabilities that are attending two and four year colleges and universities. And there'll be a little bit more about that in a few slides down the road. And then finally, you know, a lot of you talked about um, just having uh, a good life, being fulfilled, being independent. That involves making your own choices, having the right to make mistakes and learn from them. Uh, being active, engaged, contributing members of your community, things like voting, having friends, relationships, and so much more. So what transition is not? It is not a solo activity. I mean, it's not just done with an intervention specialist and a parent. It is not short-sighted. It is about the long game. It is about starting with the end in mind. It's not done without the student. The student should always be a part of transition planning. It should be done with a parent. It's not without a parent. Parents should always be involved. It's not just the responsibility of special education. Students with disabilities are general ed students first that require some sort of uh, specially designed instruction, but they should first be looked at as general ed students. And so some of those things could, the transition activities um, could involve other things that are outside of the scope of special ed. It's not a school only endeavor. It is a team sport. There are multiple people involved both in the school and from the community. It's not planned on guesses. It's intentional. It's thought out. It's based on data. It's not predetermined. Every year transition planning has to become a new event. It's not a compliance activity. It's not a one size fits all. Transition planning is about individual needs, nor is it set in stone. Even though transition planning starts at 14 and kids when they're 14 are starting to make plans for you know five, six years, uh, four, five, six years down the road. Um, everyone knows that a 14 year old's plans are gonna be a lot different probably than an 18 year olds. And, and it's not based on a deficit mindset. I see this way too often and I hear way too often that, well, you know, he's not gonna be able to go to college. He's not gonna be able to work, not gonna be able to work full time. Um, that's the battle that all of us I know fight on a daily basis is not talking about deficits, but about what students can do. And that's the foundation of transition. So quickly in Ohio, um, IDEA says transition planning starts at the age of 16. In Ohio, it starts at, during the IEP 
where the student turns 14. The transition plan is done annually and it's part of section five of the IEP. And I'll show that to you in a couple minutes. It drives the IEP. Once transition planning begins at that age 14, everything in an IEP really should involve around transition planning. It's data-driven. We're gonna talk a little about, a bit about AATA, which is Age Appropriate Transition Assessment. It's person-centered, and it's based on each individual student's PINs or their preference, interests, needs, and strengths. It's an outcome-oriented process. It's all about where do we wanna see our student when they exit public education? And it utilizes a backwards planning approach. Um, and I've got hyperlinks in here, but for time, I'm not gonna open those up. Um, I know that you'll get a copy of this later that you can go back and take a look at those. But it's about backwards planning. It's about starting, where do we wanna see the student and what do we need to do each year to help move that student towards that post-school goal that they've established for themselves. Some of you may have seen this, um, person-centered thinking. Um, if you notice who's at the center of it, it is the student. And when we are talking about collecting our data to find out what that student's pins are, we're looking at collecting information from the student, from you, from other people that know the student well about what are their preferences? What are their interests? What are their skills? And then finally, what are their needs? And the needs is really what drives what kinds of services and activities should be in that transition plan and IEP to help move that student towards their post-school goal. Here we see uh, a, an example, um, just an example of um, a backwards planning diagram. Um, and though will be another one further on down in our presentation, um, but you can see that you know, what it involves is what is their post-secondary goal for employment or for education and training? What is their course of study? What are the different things that they'll be involved in in instruction, community experience, career development, related services, and so on and so forth? So each year, uh, as the student progresses and gets closer to exiting their high school experience, um, those activities in there are gonna build and build to help move them towards that post-school outcome or goal. This is a very busy diagram um, of the whole transition planning process. It starts at the top and goes down. And you can see everything starts with age appropriate transition assessments, which leads that data leads to where does that student wanna be in education, training, employment, and independent living after high school? What are some of the services and activities that need to be provided each year to help move them towards that goal? What is the course of study? What IEP goals are going to be written that relate to transition? And then when appropriate, are um, outstanding uh, friends with adult service agencies um, might be coming on board as part of that planning process as that student moves closer to graduation. 14 is the age in Ohio that we start transition. And transition, as I said, is a team sport. Now you'll notice that the student here is in bold and big because why? The student is the most important person in the transition planning process. And these are some other folks that could be involved in that transition planning uh, process and help building that transition plan. Some of you might find out that your school has a transition specialist. And I hear from a lot of parents, all of a sudden their child's turning 14 and they're like, well, who is this person? What's a transition specialist? Basically, uh, and, and I know this is statewide, this presentation, in Cuyahoga County, we're very lucky because most of our districts have a designated transition specialist, but they're people that have had specialized training that assist the team in planning. They offer training and support to the school team, works with the family, parents, uh, uh, many times works directly with students. And a lot of these transition specialists have a credential called the Transition to Work Endorsement, which is part of their um, teaching license. So if you hear, hey, our transition specialist 
would like to come to the meeting or you see on the parent invite, they've been invited. That's who they are. They're, they're the good guys, they're friends. So we saw with that diagram previously, AATA is the foundation of transition planning. Transi and, and AATA provides that data that you use to get your preference, interests, needs, and strengths, and also the data that can help you formulate your post-school goals. Um, they could be state or districts assessments, their interest and aptitude assessments. They could be formal or informal. Some of them could be questionnaires that the intervention specialist develops. But the purpose of the AATA is to identify each and every year, what is a student's preference, interest, needs, strengths. And then that same AATA data helps the team develop sec uh, post-secondary goals um, in education, in employment, and when appropriate, independent living. Take a quick drink. Okay. So again, we've talked about our preference, interests, needs, and strengths. Um, I'm going to click on this one Piper link here because when we're talking about post-secondary goals, this is the template that has to be used on the IEP. It is always about what is going to happen after high school or after graduation. And then the student will do what? It should be observable, it should be measurable. And as they get closer to the age of graduating or exiting high school services, that uh, post-secondary goal should be very specific. Early on when they're 14, maybe not so much. Uh, and there it is again. Okay, so here's some examples of a well-written um, post-secondary goal for employment. Just a couple here, part-time after graduation. Amy will have part-time position in community retail environment or could be employed part-time in the community with supports or self-employed as a welder. You'll notice this is always about after graduation and it is as specific as possible for independent living after graduation. Amy will participate in a community integrated recreation leisure activities at the local recreation center. Amy will live with a friend in an apartment while receiving supports for budgeting and community safety. And some other examples there. And for education and training, after graduation or after receiving her diploma, Amy will take business math courses at Tri-C or complete a welding course at the ABC Technical School. The important thing to remember with these post-school goals is that it is always written about what is going to happen after graduation and everything that is done during that transition process from age 14 on is about trying to realize and put things in place to help students realize these post-school goals. One of the big, big things that um, that transition or that age appropriate transition assessments does is it points out what are the students needs. Um, this hyperlink that's here, you can take a look at it at a later time. It gives you a lot of examples of what are transition services or activities. But the important thing is that whenever a need is identified through your AATA, the team has to decide, is this a need that we want to provide a service or activity during this IEP period to address that need? It is not what the student or parent will do, it's what the school will do um, and it's not an opportunity. So if you see a transition service saying, the student will be given the opportunity to job shadow, that would be not a good way because how do you measure an opportunity? So they have to be measurable. It's about what the district or the school is going to offer. It has to be measurable, um, it is monitored, and it has to have a student outcome. Um, a special word on self-determination and self-advocacy. There is compelling data about the importance of teaching students to be self-determined and to be their own advocates and to have a voice in their lives. So you're probably wondering why is there a life jacket in this slide? 
Well, I, I hate to say it, but a lot of times what I see in schools um, and especially in special education is that um, special education is like a life jacket that we're, 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 we're not teaching those skills to students to become more independent. We want to be helpers. We want to be there. We don't want them to fail. And you can see at the bottom, making mistakes and failing is okay because that's how you learn. And so a lot of times what happens is, okay, time to graduate. I'm going to yank that, that life jacket away, get out there and swim. And we really need to think long and hard of how do we empower our students to the greatest extent possible so their voice is heard. Nothing about me without me. Um, and the other link is the self-directed IEP. Back in the old days when I was the work study coordinator at Solon High School, I ran a class after school teaching students how to run their own IEP meetings. Um, some didn't like doing it. Some went kicking and screaming. Some participated a little bit, but it moved the needle on students coming to the IEP meeting and to the greatest extent possible running their meeting, being the ones that are in charge. Course of study is another important part of annual transition planning. So on that IEP form, you might see things like the Ohio Learning Standards or the Ohio Learning Standards Extended um, or a functional life skills curriculum. There needs to be a connection between the course of study and what the student says they want to do. If they say they want to, after graduation from high school, go to um, Cleveland State University and major in business, well, the course of study while they're in school that leads to that type of post-school outcome should most likely be the Ohio Learning Standards um, and, and those courses that are involved in the Ohio Learning Standards. So there needs to be a connection between what's, what's the post-school goal and what, what's the course of study this year? So here's section five from the IEP. Um, and this, um, again, starting the IEP period when the student turns 14 in Ohio, section five of the IEP really should drive the entire um, IEP. And what you see here, it says for post-secondary training and education, it's duplicated for the, um, for the other two areas, employment and independent, li and independent living. Um, what happens if the AATA data indicates that there's no needs in a certain area? For instance, the AATA may, say, may show that um, the student is right where every other typical peer their, their age is, and the team says, well, we don't think we need transition planning or services for independent living. It still has to be documented in the IEP. There has to be a reason why um, there is not something written in that section. So just an important point to remember. I'm not gonna read this to you guys because it's a lot of um, um, statute about what transition planning is. Um, so we're gonna kind of move on here. I, I've covered a lot here um, and um, I, I want to, you to have an opportunity when you can to go back and, and look at that material. But we're going to do a quick check for understanding, and we're not going to use the chat for this. Yeah, um, but I want you to score yourself and see who of you gets um, 100% on these five questions. Um, just a reminder, if you could mute, because I'm hearing somebody out there, I'd appreciate it. Thanks. So question one, true or false, transition planning in Ohio starts at age 16. If you said false, you are correct. Transition planning in Ohio starts during the IEP when the student turns 14. Okay, fill in the blank. The what provides the data that helps identify each student's preference, interests, needs, and strengths. If you said age-appropriate transition assessment which again is done annually and is often involved with asking you, the parent who knows the student well for information to help complete the AATA to identify those pins. Um, that is what should, uh, should be done. Okay, 
fill in the blank, three answers here. There are three areas that support post-school goals, okay? There's three primary areas of transition where we have post-school outcomes. If you said, or if you wrote down somewhere, employment, you are correct. If you said education and training, you are correct. And if you said independent living or community participation, you are correct. Very good. I'm sure everybody out there is nailing this. Multiple choice, the practice and philosophy of building the transition plan around what the student envisions as his or her good life. Is that school-centered planning? Is that person-centered planning? Or is that community-centered planning? And if you pick B, you are correct. That is person-centered planning. It's all about that individual student and what that student's preference, interests, needs, and strengths are and what their post-school goals and desires are. And our final question, the transition planning process of starting with the end in mind, and I'll give you a hint, and working backwards, is called a transition service, course of study, or backwards planning. If you said backwards planning, you are correct. Now, Amy doesn't know this, but if you have 100%, make sure you uh, email her, tell her you got them all right, and she's gonna send you some fantastic prize for being so smart. So these adult service agencies, what you have here, you have some links. Probably some of you have already worked with your county board of DD um, with different services that they may provide that your child may need. Some of you may or may not have heard of opportunities for Ohioans with disabilities. Both of these um, hyperlinks take you to those agencies, but since opportunities for Ohioans with disabilities usually doesn't start or doesn't start until the student is age 14, that's the age when a student can become eligible for their services. Um, I would say, take a look at that. Um, Ohio is uh, one of around 30 some states in the United States that is uh, called an employment first state where we are always looking at competitive integrated employment for all students um, and working towards that. So, and I know opportunities for uh, uh, Ohioans with disabilities and our county boards of DD work very well and very collaboratively with each other to um, help provide those services to move those students towards that competitive integrated employment. Some parent resources. Um, I'm sure some of these look familiar to you, um, but I just thought I would put these in here as well in case you've not heard of these different um, resources that are really very um, in uh, informing for parents, um, really help build capacity, um, help parents and families become better prepared to participate in the transition planning process. That was a lot. And um, I, I apologize for steamrolling through that because I gave you a lot, a lot of information um, but I, like I said at the beginning, I do know that the plan is for you to have um, some speakers that are going to be coming at the next sessions to kind of elaborate on some of the things that I've talked about. So um, Wendy, uh, for some reason, the um, pictures of people have disappeared completely from my screen. So I'll see if I can find that. But do we have any questions? I know we wanna save a little time here for Amy. Yeah, we do have some questions and I, I see more coming through. You guys continue putting those questions in. We have a question and um, there are two similar ones. One is, is it too late to start backwards planning at 19 years old? Never too late. Yeah. Ne ne never too late. As a matter of fact, um, I have a, a, a student of mine at Cleveland State who is in his early 20s and has just realized that he has a disability. And we talked a lot about that, that let's talk about backwards planning, about where you wanna be. So it's absolutely never too late. And when you think about it, 
we all do it in our lives anyhow. It's a lot of the charting the life course work. Um, so, it, you know, it, it, no. So to answer the question simply, never too late. And we have a never too late question too. Is it ever too late to pick an end goal and figure out how to get there? Um, no, no, not at all. I, you know, what, obviously when, you know, students are younger and they're 14, 15 years old, you know, it, they kind of have an idea about what they want. They're very general, you know, talking about not specific occupations and specific um, education and training that they may want to do, but you're really looking at, you know, what, what are your hobbies? What do you like to do in your free time? You know, you know, while I like to help my mom repair the, um, you know, the car or work on the chainsaw. Okay, so you like working with your hands. So, you know, maybe a post-school goal could be a job working with your hands. As you get closer to that time of exiting school services, it should be much more specific. We'll be high, we'll work full-time at Chagrin Pet and Garden in the uh, repair department, as an example. We have some more questions, but I, Bob, um, Amy has lost control over anything. So I don't know if you can give the controls back in any way as I continue to ask you questions. Um, is that because I have control? Maybe. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll try to multitask here while okay. you're... We have a comment. Is this presentation ever done for school districts? Most of this information seems to be a mystery and difficult for families to get or get to. Well, um, I think that's one of the reasons why we're here. Yes, that, and as a matter of fact, that, that is part of my job. Um, I, I notice a colleague of mine from uh, an adult service agency is here. I'm not gonna call her out, but we serve together um, on uh, a, a county collaborative where um, school personnel uh, and adult service agencies come together. And that's one of our priorities for this year is to try to develop ways where we're taking the guesswork out of things that developing some tools about um, to help parents ask questions because one of the things we hear a lot is, parents don't know what to ask until it's kind of too late. And it's always that, gee, I wish I would have known to ask this. So that's a priority for our group. And we've been working with the local parent mentors um, to, to you know, develop a tool that's very parent friendly. These are some questions, you know, depending on your student, you might want to ask when they're in grades K through four, when they're in grades, uh, five through six, when they're in grades seven through eight, nine through 12. Okay, another, uh, we have another comment. Where can I find examples of backwards planning? And actually we're gonna have a whole nother evening where we talk about backwards planning too. So. Right, and, and um, take a look at the, in the PowerPoint presentation, there's a backwards planning hyperlink that takes you to a template that was developed by the Ohio Employment First Office. Um, very, very good information there. Um, is, the real, is the reality of the transition planning as far from your presentation, how can you best interact with the school district. If, if the reality of the transition planning is far from what you presented, how can we best interact with our school district? You know, I, I, I think the best, the best thing to do is to come prepared with your information. Um, you know, I, I obviously, you know, going in and saying that I, I realize the transition process should work this way. What happens a lot of times, um, and um, you know, I, I understand it sometimes, is that school districts get in more of a compliance type of mind frame that, you know, okay, we did this, we did this, we did this, and sometimes the student gets lost in that. I'm not, I, and, and I'm not saying all schools do that. Most schools do a very, very good job. 
But I would say, you know, come prepared with your information. Um, you're learning through this presentation and other ones um, about that process. Um, if your district has a parent mentor, um, they are usually very, very well versed in this. So I would suggest maybe asking them to join you as well. Anybody else? Sorry about that. Something, something weird going on with my, I don't know if you guys can see it, but it looks like the terminal tower is growing out of my head. <laughs> Maybe I'll just turn my video off. <laughs> Was Amy able to uh, regain any? Uh... I don't think so. Oh boy. I hmm. can't do anything. She just sent me that message. I know okay. that um, we are not done. I mean, we still have some time for more questions. If anybody has questions, um, Amy was gonna do a little, um, maybe, Maybe, Amy, if you hear me, if you can maybe um, log back in, she was going to do a little presentation, but I'm also in the chat box putting um, uh, the evaluation for the evening down. Um, whenever you get a chance, if you could com complete that, it just gives us really good information. Um, so I'm going to, and let's see if we can get Amy on. I'm looking at the chat too, and I and I appreciate the um, positive feedback. Like like I say, I I, I know this is a lot of information um, to to share. But you know, another question that I just thought of, especially if you're in the Cuyahoga County area where there are a lot a lot of transition specialists, there's nothing wrong with asking. Is is there a transition specialist in our district? Okay, is, there is. I, can I talk with that person? Um, or if not, who, who in our district, if they don't have a designated, or if they don't have a transition specialist or coordinator, ask who actually um, is responsible for transition planning? Is it the intervention specialist? Starting at 14, in my opinion, and I, and, I, and I think it's great that Ohio decided 14, whereas IDEA says 16. I still think it's too young or too, too old rather. I, I really feel like, you know, there should be more conversations earlier on. Um, and again, a lot of those conversations, if a student's in fourth grade and we're talking about student wanting to go on to college, you know, that's the time to really kind of talk about, okay, backwards plan this. What are they gonna need? What skills do they need? What courses they gonna, should they take? Amy, I see your back, are you there? No, I see your little box. Don't you hate yeah, this technology? Yeah, she just sent me a message and she said, ask Bob to check his email and maybe he could just share my slides. For some reason she's logging back on, but she can't, she can't unmute. Or, or, or she doesn't even look muted. She can't do anything for some reason. Looking for them right now. I'm assuming she sent them to me, but I'm not seeing them. And I'm gonna work on getting backward planning link to, oh, let me work on getting that link uh, for the next program if that's not correct on there. This is why kids need to be in school and not learning virtually. We're all adults and look at the issues that, and it's not our fault, it's just, this is, there it is, okay. I, Amy's. Technology is great, but it definitely has its, uh, Hello, can you guys hear me? Yes. How about that? But you can't see me. No. Okay. Well, I'm, I apologize for all of this, Bob. You did a great job with uh, uh, skating through this uh, big presentation and getting us all started for the school year. Amy, 
Can you see my screen? No. We okay. as parents. Can I can see it. I can see it. Um, okay, thank you. Well, if you go to slide five, I'll talk with you all while Bob shares my slides. How's that sound? We can do this. Okay. Thank you. We're on slide five, Amy. Okay, great. Well, Bob set, set this up awesome for this next few minutes. I wanted to let you all know that I am a Charting the Life course ambassador in Ohio. And I feel very passionate about this because I use the tools not only in my personal life, some of you may or may not know that I have an adult child, uh, my son who still lives with us and requires a lot of support. Uh, I use the Charting the Life course tools to help me think of how to continue to help him have a good life. And the, I wish I would have had these tools earlier in his life, for example, when he started middle school. So that's why I wanted to share them with you today, because there's some examples here that I think are very easy to use. Um, as well as there's some upcoming uh, very simple and yet very poignant um, important webinars coming up next week that'll take a deeper dive into using some of these tools for your upcoming school meetings and community meetings. So as Bob said, um, parents, next slide, please, Bob. Okay, we're there. Thank you, six. Um, parents and families, and especially the teen and young adult, are vital on the team. Uh, team conversations can and should happen together. And I feel that the Charting the Life course tools can really benefit because if everybody's looking at the person and their family as a unit and a vision come together with a, an important vision that's been thought about clearly. And what type of supports does that teen or young adult or your loved one need to achieve their goals, not just now, but in the future? That These tools can help you get there. So I like to ask parents, to use some of these tools at home, at the dinner table, talk to your whole family about your loved one and ask your loved one also, what's important to you? You know, what do you see as areas that you would like to have five years from now? So if you don't get anything out of this next few minutes on charting the life course tools, the link on slide six, which you'll get a copy of these slides, will share with you the couple of pages of tools that have questions in each of the boxes to help you think through what to ask, what to say, how to think about your loved one. And Conversely, together in parallel, you know, depending on the age of your child or the person you're trying to help, they can do this too. And it can be done in a conversation versus writing down in the tools. So take a look at that link. And then next slide, please. Slide seven, I believe. Yeah, we're there. Okay, because I am not. <laughs> So slide seven, um, is that the star, Bob? Yes, yeah, with, with Gab Gabriel in the middle. Okay, Gabriel's support star is really important here because this is something anyone can do right now. Gabriel is 12 and he and his mom wanted to at least start somewhere. So they took one of the tools called a support star and put him in the middle. And you know how Bob talked about all the pins, the preferences, interests, needs, and, and supports 
and services and strengths. All of that can be combine, combined into a baseline support star around your child. So if you fill out each of the five segments of the star, like Gabriel and his mom did, this is his baseline into, you know, sort of a looking glass into where he's at now. Then over the next year, two, three, and beyond years, they knew how to add to that. So instead of just looking at what the child cannot do, you want to use these tools for a good life, looking at what they do have. And think about his or her life in these five areas, technology, community supports, what's he eligible for? What does she like to use with technology? What's she good at? Who do we know that's already important in her life or our lives? And then the next slide, please. So this, again, I don't have in front of me, I'm just going off of memory, is Gabriel's um, domains. And again, the domains are listed in that web link I gave you previously, broken down into daily life and employment. And if you read through the questions online or in the upcoming webinars, even though five years from now is a long way off, Gabriel and his mom really wanted to think about okay, if I could vision a life for you, with you five years from now, what do each of these sections look like? What do you do during the day when school's over? What does an ideal day look like? And what are the bad days? What's community living? So as much as, like Bob said, it's hard for us to look at our children as being fully independent outside of our house sometimes, right? And I get that. But some people and kids and families do want to do that. So if it's important for your child now at the age of 12 or 14 or 16 to move out of the house when they're an adult, this is the chance to talk about well, where will you live? What skills do you need to do to have to work on to get there? Do you need to learn how to get around if you live outside of our house? Do you need new people and places to understand and help you what technology and home modifications you might need? So again, Gabriel and his mom took this in a really creative way. And you can keep on going into the next slide, Bob, to see the second half of each of the life domains. They looked at it in past tense. In other words, assuming he would get there, this is what he has had or did have. And I thought that was brilliant. And I wanted to share that with you in an enthusiastic way so that you knew you can do this, learn about these life tools in the next upcoming sessions I'm gonna give you on the next slide. So Bob, advance to the next slide, please, and tell me what's there, is that Nate? Uh, I'm sorry? Yeah, yes, yes, it's uh, Nate pre-employment. Nate's pre-employment. He, he and his parents used a different tool it's a trajectory tool. And this one can be more dynamic where you can draw pictures. Um, it gives you some talking points about on the left side, what are the past experiences that you've all had, whether together as a family or just your son or daughter right now going through transition? What are the past life experiences that are positive, that make you feel good about where you're at and why you wanna choose 
uh, something in a, ahead in your future to look forward to. And then this all is a trajectory that goes toward the right hand side of the screen where it talks about, okay, this is where I wanna end up. This is my vision based on past life experiences that are not only good, but bad. And this is why I want to work on getting to the end goal, which is the big box on the right. And Nate and his mom chose to focus on two goals. This trajectory is focused on pre-employment. What did I hate in the past, right? He didn't like it when people didn't listen to him. He, he hated it when people did not listen, did not think he was important enough to listen to, and didn't include him in the conversations. So, of course, he wanted to have a job that was meaningful to him. You guys all shouted out in the, in the waterfall, I think it was called. Meaningful, purposeful happy, safe, community, connected, independence. This is where you think about that trajectory and what's, what's important to your sons and daughters. And then of course, at the bottom, you need to remind everybody and each other what you don't want. And I think that these tools can be very powerful parents if you show up at your first IEP meeting or at your next IEP meeting, thinking through some of these really powerful questions and tools and say, I've already done some homework along with Gabriel or Nate or Johnny or Timmy. I've already worked on this. And we have come up with all of these interesting, very important uh, vision uh, tools and helping our son and daughter have a good life. And we think this is a good starting point for this school year. And then next slide, please. Of course, now it's Nate's um, social piece. Nate's mom really needed a way to think about him having that connection in his community. He wanted, she wanted him to be safe. You know, of course, Nate just wanted a job where he was valued and listened to and could have good, meaningful work. She was also worried about his safety uh, the need to not have to rely on transportation somewhere where he could ride his bike safely, where people would look out for him. And the reason why I'm bringing up um, Nate's story is because as much as they wanted employment, they first focused on this social connection piece. And after they sat down and did the trajectory, they just chose to work on the social pieces first. And because they did the trajectory, they found a local ice cream shop that he loved to go to, that he could ride his bike to, and his neighbors knew who he was, so he felt safe and so did his mom along the route. And all of a sudden, they put two and two together and said, hey, you know, is there anything that Nate can do here and have, have an employment opportunity here? And they said, yeah, of course, we, we, we can hire man. We'd love to hire Nate. He's so friendly and fun and social. We need more people like Nate here. So he got a job, even though that wasn't their first priority. So I'm introducing these tools to you today just as an introduction. The next slide, Bob, I think has the two upcoming trainings on charting the life course. Again, it's focusing on a good life. And a good life means so many things to so many people who have so many different needs 
you know, no longer it's past history where we talk about going to day programs, right? That's in the past. We may need adult day services, but it's still part of a good life for your sons and daughters. So if out of anything, please check out the tools Email me, ask me questions about them, or sign up for the upcoming trainings I have listed for next week. I thank you for your time. I'm sorry for the technical glitches here. Um, if Wendy knows there are questions or if Bob or Wendy can help me from this point on, I would be delighted. <laughs> okay, we do have some questions. Um, how do we address an individual that answers on some of those questions that they just don't care? Assuming this is to me. Yes, Amy, that's for you. I'm the questions on the, okay. The questions on the life course tools. Right. So that's really a tough one. If they don't care, then of course, my opinion is going to be now wearing two hats as a mom and as a professional. Find the thing that they do care about. And that's what drives all of the tools. When they talk about and share with you and others on the team or their friends, things that they do care about, then that's where you start. So it's hard. And I say that, I say that with a mom emotion. This is really hard work, right? If if our kids don't know how to answer or they don't care, it's really hard to find that wisdom, but they have someone has to help us pull that out of them. And it's a team effort. Don't forget what Bob said. Someone will get there if we focus on what they desire and what's fun and engaging to them. And somehow it comes out. So these are tools, right? But some of our young ones, our youth, they don't like these charts. You know, my son wouldn't sit down and use these charts. They'd look at it as homework. It's more about a conversation for some of our kids. I hope that helps. Um, just looking. I know some of you, if you have very specific questions, my suggestion is probably to reach out to, to Amy. Is that okay that I said that, Amy? Yes, absolutely. Please give them, again, my... Um, number and emails on the slide in the beginning yeah but um i'm very passionate about helping parents think through this because while we have to have team meetings at school we also have to learn the school lingo and go through the assessments but if we just show up with some kind of thinking and important facts about our child that is encouraging to the team, the team along with you in it should really embrace that and say, oh my gosh, we've got a kickstart for the school year here. Let's go with that and see where, where this year goes. And we have two other things kind of um, someone had written, if the child is in school and can't be in the charting of life course, is it still a good thing for parents to do without them? And I think that is for the adults to come, right? The program, and then that's something you can do with your child um, anytime. I'm sorry, I may not understand the question correctly. Says, Our if the child is in school and can't be in the charting of life course, course is it still good for the parent to do without them oh I see apart from the child yeah 
That's a tough one. My professional hat says, look, um, we really would prefer that the parents, the families, the caregivers do this alongside. Um, but us moms and dads and caregivers, right? We are very anxious and very enthusiastic about what our child's abilities are. And we do want to do this. So I would say, yes, absolutely. Start somewhere. That's the key. You can even start with yourself. Take your child out of it. Start with yourself and use one of the tools on yourself because we're all humans who continue to learn and grow and change is constant, right? We're always adapting. Look at COVID. It's a big, big adaption. <laughs> so I would say start somewhere. It's a must. Um, show up with something all ready to encourage the support and conversation at school meetings and at community meetings. Okay, but the actual program that we just talked about that's coming up, it's actually for parents, correct? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, that's for parents and you're, they're not really gonna, they're gonna get started thinking about it, but they're really not gonna be doing the hard work during, during the session, is that correct? Well, Lynn's session is on the 16th. She's gonna be talking about a checklist and using some of the, the life course tools to go over the checklists of how to get started with life course and transition checklists. Mm -hmm. The other one, the charting the life course um, live session is going through each of the domains that I shared with you earlier on um, Gabriel's slides, I believe. Each of the domains and going through and asking you questions. So that's not going to be transition focused. That's gonna be for anyone who joins that live session on the 17th but it's good to get your feet wet. We have trouble as parents knowing how to participate in transition because it is overwhelming. We're immersed in the day-to-day. -day. It's worth your time. And there's a lot of us around the state and locally that are ambassadors that can help you. The transition specialist that Bob recommended Ask for one. If you don't have one, get to know who they are in the school district or at the county board. Um, uh, another thing is I'm rereading all of this. So um, the charting the life course, if we go back to, um, if we have a student that just doesn't, doesn't know, you know, I think you kind of touched on it, but I'm just reading some of the messages that were sent to me. And I know we did, I don't care, but what happens if they don't know? I guess we kind of just address it, you address it the same way. If the student is saying, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Yes, so start somewhere small. For example, you, you know, you have to start somewhere small, for example, when the team at school says they want to do the, what's it called, Bob, the AATA? Age appropriate transition assessment. You got it. Yeah. Um, what would they be looking at? They'd be looking at preferences, interests, needs, and strengths. If you took the support star and just wrote that out as a baseline for your child now, and then 
based on how well you know them as as their parent or as if you are a professional on the call, you could make another one with the team for that five years from now mark or three years from now or whenever they are ready to graduate and compare them. Uh, it's not an easy task when your child is either non-responsive or they don't know. But you know as their mom or dad or as a primary caregiver or important support person in their life, you know what makes them tick. You know what excites them. So even if someone's nonverbal or has no way of knowing, especially for those of you who have a 12-year-old, 13-year-old, and you're just beginning to think of this, what makes them tick? What are they good at? Start there. And then they have to have some experiences and it will come. That's, that's all I can say is some, some of this work is really hard and it takes some one-on-one -on -one work, uh, some brainstorming, but you have to start with some of the questions on the life course tools. Amy, the one thing I was going to add is I the thing I like about the life course tools is it 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 moves things out of the compliance domain and yes. gets people to think about the person. You know, I I I I, I know parents that when they're talking about their students, they they in coming to meetings, they bring pictures and things, and this is my child, and this is what my, who my child is. The thing I love about the charting the life course is it it really reminds you that we're talking about a person. Absolutely. You know, a person who has brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles and neighbors and pets and right and and fears and and desires and you know everything that we have. And I think sometimes educators lose sight of that because they for, you know, forget that we're talking about individuals that you know, are, are not students. They're not, they're, they're not transition plans, they're real people. So that's why I'm a fan of the, the tools and charting the life course. Thank you, Bob. That's, that's a good assessment. Anything else? Um, There's one more question. Yeah, go ahead, Lori. Okay. Thank you. Um, sure. Any recommendations? I'm oh, sorry. For children who may not have the abilities for employment, you mentioned adult day programs are a thing of the past but is there a place for them in certain demographic of young adults? Well, I'll address that and then I'll ask every Laurie and Bob to chime in. So when I said, think about day programs as a thing as past in history, in other words, what I'll clarify, thank you so much for bringing this up. What I really meant and mean by that is that's not just the next thing after high school. There's a whole person and a whole person's good life. Adult services may just be one piece of that, but there could be recreation and community around that person where adult services supports that as well. Um, it's probably hard to think about sometimes, but, uh, you know, years ago, that was all that was there for some of our youth after high school. If you could not get a job or did not want to go to college, what's left, right? Well, sometimes there's a lot left with the right supports. So that's sort of the ideal dream I want to challenge you to think about. 
There could be a lot more. There could be skiing, adaptive skiing. There could be um, rec programs at the local rec center. There could be all kinds of stuff. Bob, Laurie, do you have anything else to add to that? Um, I I don't I don't know, Amy. I think you I think you said it well. Like I. I mean, I, I've been in this field long enough to, you know, coming in right, you know, not too long after public law 94-142 was signed into law and I've seen the evolution and, you know, I know adult day programs are still part of the continuum, but I, I think that, that one of the things that I see that's different now is that there's always this this discussion about, you know, okay, that this isn't the end. Is there something else? Is there, is there the potential for some level of competitive integrated employment with supports possible in conjunction with an adult day program? It doesn't have to be all or nothing. Mm -hmm. I guess that's all I can add to that, that conversation. And I'd also like to add that, um, think a little creatively as well about employment because um, I sit on the Employment Collaborative for a couple of different county boards and there are some jobs that are coming through that are really you know, unique and different. And I think a lot of our individuals uh, could be very successful in them. Um, my son is in a job right now and they did have a lot of expectations, but the job coach went in there and talked to the, the supervisor and said, realistically, this is what we can accomplish within this set of hours and worked with the boss to, you know, the ex expectations were, became different. So I think we need to think a little bit more creatively about jobs and also the volunteer opportunities are out there for individuals to do things that they really love to do, their hobbies. Thank you. I'm so glad you remembered to bring up volunteering. I uh, failed to bring that up. Volunteering has enriched so many people's lives right now, especially during COVID, because you can um, be more flexible with volunteering sometimes. Um, and it gives a lot of meaning to many, many individuals' lives as well. Yes. Thank you. Anything else on the chat? Nothing. A Amy, I was going to say that speaking of charting the life course, I have to pick my daughter up from work who's that doesn't have her driver's license yet. So anyhow, I, I, I unfortunately need to leave the conversation and I wish I didn't. So I, I, I just wanted to say thank you um, for giving me this chance to come and talk to the group. And um, you know, I look forward to continuing the, uh, the conversation down the road. I know you've got some great uh, presentations coming up. And so thank you. Well, thank you so much, Bob. We are so glad you could be here tonight um, with us. And thank you for helping out with the tech piece. Um, Everyone, thank you all. Also, we're going to sign off for now. This webinar has been recorded, I hope, um, and we'll have it on our website. Um, thank you again. Have a great rest of your evening, everyone. Bye-bye.
Hey, is everybody signed off? I'm sweating. Yeah. My computer screen is totally stuck right now. Yeah. I mean, I'm completely stuck. And I have some hate emails. I know I do.